You are all very welcome to Belfast Historic City Hall this evening for the Northern Ireland Holocaust Day commemoration. My name is Paul Clark, and I am honored to be invited to lead the proceedings this morning along with our regional ambassador, alumni for the Holocaust Education Trust, Molly Liggett. Holocaust Memorial Day is the International Day of Remembrance to remember the six million Jews murdered during the Holocaust, alongside the millions of people murdered under Nazi persecution of other groups and during the more recent genocides in Cambodia, Rwanda, Bosnia, and Darfur. It takes place every year on the 27th of January, the anniversary of the liberation of Auschwitz-Birkenau concentration camp. The theme chosen by the Holocaust Memorial Day Trust for 2024 is the fragility of freedom. Freedom means different things to different people. What is clear is that in every genocide that has taken place, those who are targeted for persecution have had their freedoms restricted and removed before many of them were murdered. Not only do perpetrator regimes erode the freedom of the people they are targeting, demonstrating how fragile freedom is, they also restrict the regime, the freedoms of others around them to prevent people from challenging the regime. Despite this, in every genocide, there are those who risk their own freedom to help others, to preserve others' freedoms, or to stand up to the regime. So let us make time this evening to reflect on the vulnerability of the freedoms and how we can all play our part in safeguarding them. Our commemoration begins tonight with a welcome address from the Lord Mayor of Belfast, Councillor Ryan Murphy, on Tard Vera, Tafolchirot on Shaw, on Wailam Kainchlin Anish. Would you now speak to us? Gurmogut, Paul, Jadiv, Akarja, it's honour Wardu Falcha, Karov and Shaw, Hikhalan and Kathrak and Belfursia. Good evening, everyone, and I'm delighted to be able to welcome you to Belfast City Hall this evening. And on behalf of Belfast City Council, I want to welcome you to this evening's commemoration as we gather to remember the victims and survivors of the Holocaust and of subsequent genocides. This Saturday coming will mark Holocaust Memorial Day, the date coinciding with the anniversary of the liberation of Auschwitz. It's a day that's been set aside to call on people to remember the terrible atrocities of the Holocaust and subsequent genocides, the horrors of which will continue to resonate for many years to come. Indeed, this year also marks 30 years since the Rwandan Tutsi genocide. And we think of all of those who have lost their lives and had their lives irrevocably changed as a result. The theme for Holocaust Memorial Day this year is the fragility of freedom. And this has particular significance for us here in the city of Belfast, as we continue to welcome individuals and families who arrive in our city to seek sanctuary and freedom. I had an opportunity to read up on the theme vision, and the one thing that stood out to me is how, especially as a millennial growing up in Western society, there's a lot of freedoms that we take for granted. Things like the, move, the freedom of movement, the freedom of expression, and the freedom of reproduction. And it's shocking learning that the denial of these freedoms took place and often is part of a wider process that led the genocide. Tonight, we remember the six million Jewish people and the other minority communities, the Sinti and Roma people, black people, people who were gay, people with disabilities, all of whom had lives, families, hopes and aspirations of their own, but were tragically cut short by the horrors of the Holocaust. We also remember the millions of lives and the generations lost due to subsequent genocides. And we think about the many lives that are currently being lost in conflicts in many parts of the world today. The Holocaust and subsequent genocides illustrates the dangers of prejudice, prejudice that becomes rooted within anti-Semitism, Islamophobia, anti-refugee racism, sectarianism, homophobia, and other forms of discrimination and dehumanization. Sadly, the kind of hatred that led to the Holocaust unfortunately lives as people continue to dehumanize others and find excuses to deny them their freedoms. 
But the best way for us to remember the victims and survivors of the Holocaust and other genocides is to have the courage to stand up to protect freedom, to challenge hatred, and to interrupt the processes that escalates from words, prejudice, and exclusion to awful acts of violence. In essence, it's through events such as this where we are calling to protect and safeguard the dignity and the worth of every human being. We remember also the perils of remaining silent and our own power of the act and the interrupt the expressions of rage, division, and other forms of prejudice that foster separation, fear, and hostility, and threatens values of freedom, equality, and diversity. Tonight, we remember the millions of lives cut short and the families and communities devastated by the Holocaust and subsequent genocides. We also thank those who have shared their, their painful journeys with us. Like Alfred, who we'll hear from this evening, we're so grateful to have him joining us here in Belfast. I had the opportunity to meet Alfred earlier this morning. It was a very powerful story that he told, and one of the, the things that stands out for me was him addressing the issue of hate. To quote him, he said, hatred destroys all of us, and he's absolutely right. I want to conclude by thanking those who have been involved in the organization of this important annual commemoration, and a special thanks also to the Holocaust Memorial Day Trust, and in particular to Shirley Lennon, for your ongoing support and advice, and for ensuring that the lessons learned from the Holocaust are not lost, and that people don't forget what happened. Thank you. I now welcome Gareth Johnson, Deputy Secretary of Good Relations and Inclusion at the Executive Office, to speak on behalf of the government. Good evening, everyone, and can I start by bringing greetings from Dr. Jane Brady, head of the civil service, uh, and her apologies that she wasn't be able to be here this evening. I'm honored to have been invited to join you all this evening as we gather to commemorate the victims of the Holocaust and of more recent genocides such as those in Cambodia, Bosnia, Rwanda, and Darfur. Holocaust Memorial Day reminds us that we must all strive to eradicate hate, intolerance, and prejudice. It's a day to come together in remembrance of those who have suffered because of something that made them who they were, their ethnicity, sexuality, ability, faith, or another form of identity. Through our collective acts of remembrance here tonight and elsewhere throughout the world at this time of year, we remember the brave people who stood up for freedom at all costs, and we honor the survivors of the Holocaust and subsequent genocides. As the Lord Mayor has said, the theme this year is the fragility of freedom, and we can so easily take for granted the many freedoms that we enjoy, the freedom to choose where we live, the freedom to express an opinion, the freedom to shape the path that we want to follow in life. It can be easy to forget that not everyone enjoys these freedoms. They are fragile. They need to be protected. It is important not to be complacent. We must spot the signs of eroding freedoms early by promoting tolerance and kindness in our lives. In the course of my responsibilities for good relations, I've seen firsthand the good work that's being done and the positive outcomes that are being delivered to celebrate diversity and promote equality and bring our society closer together. I see dedicated public servants and those across the community working hard to promote good relations, working hard to challenge discrimination and hatred, working hard to promote tolerance and equality for all who live here. 
The Together Building a United Community strategy reflects the Executive's commitment to improve community relations and continue the journey toward a more united and shared society. A society where people of all religions, political and ethnic backgrounds are valued, respected and treated equally. We recognise the importance of events such as this in this journey. I'm proud that the Executive Office can support this work because we all have a duty to stand up to hate and discrimination in our society. We all have a responsibility to address inequality and injustice before rights and freedoms are compromised. We all have the potential to impact change positively. I believe that the testimonies of survivors of the Holocaust, such as Dr. Alfred Garwood, whom you'll hear shortly, play a fundamental role in helping us to understand and to learn from the past. I'm reminded of how after surviving ghettos, concentration camps and a death march, Holocaust survivor Alec Ward came to England. He said, I could walk freely wherever I wanted. I could ride a bicycle. The freedoms we take as red. I started by talking about people who had suffered because of their identity. An identity is the story that makes us who we are. Tonight we celebrate those stories. We pause for reflection to remember the past, and to focus on what we can all do to ensure a positive future for all. I'd like to join in thanking all of those involved in once again making this occasion such a poignant and meaningful commemoration. Thank you. On Saturday the 20th of June, 1942, reflecting on May 1940, when the Germans arrived in the Netherlands, Anne Frank wrote, that was when the trouble started for the Jews. Our freedom was severely restricted by a series of anti-Jewish decrees. Jews were required to wear a yellow star Jews were required to turn in their bicycles. Jews were forbidden to use trams. Jews were forbidden to ride in cars, even their own. Jews were required to do their shopping between 3 and 5 p.m. Jews were required to frequent only Jewish-owned barber shops and beauty salons. Jews were forbidden to be out on the streets between 8 p.m. and 6 a.m. Jews were forbidden to go to theatres, cinemas, or any other forms of entertainments. Jews were forbidden to visit Christians in their homes. You couldn't do this, and you couldn't do that. But life went on. Our keynote speaker for this evening has experienced for himself how fragile freedom can be. We are pleased to have Dr. Alfred Garwood, a survivor of Bergen-Belsen concentration camp, with us this evening to share his experiences. Dr. Alfred Garwood. Good evening. David Farber was 15 years old in April 1945 when he was sent from Auschwitz concentration camp to Bergen-Belsen concentration camp. And he was wearing his tattered prison pajamas and he tells the following story. I woke on a bunk 
dead men on either side of me. The stench of death was everywhere. Typhus, delirious and shivering with fever, I knew I must get out or die with them. Somehow I dragged myself into the fresh air and sat against the side of the barrack, warming my body in the sun. Gradually, as my vision cleared, I saw a man dressed in normal clothes with a yellow star, and he was looking at me. He was carrying a blonde child in his arms and holding a little girl by the hand. I could not believe my eyes. He called to me, and he asked me to look for his family. He promised to give me bread, and he threw some over the barbed wire, and I struggled to reach it in the desperate scramble it created. I clung onto a piece, and I ate it lovingly. It brought me another day's life. He returned the next day, but I'd not been able to find any of his family. He still threw another piece of bread over. That brought me another day's life. The following day, when I looked to his part of the camp, it was deserted. I thought it must have been a delusion caused by my delirium. My fever, fever was, wor was worse, and I soon became too weak to leave the barracks. Sometimes later, I heard the voices of British soldiers after I had been fed and nursed back to strength. A British soldier approached me. Miraculously, it was my brother-in-law. My sister had gone to England before the war and they had married. He arranged for me to go to London to live with them in Black Lion Yard just off the Whitechapel Road, the main road of the Jewish East End of London. Walking along Black Line Yard one afternoon, I saw a man coming towards me, carrying a blonde child. He looked just like the man who had saved my life in Belson. I hesitated and then approached him cautiously. I asked apologetically so as not to offend him, Excuse me, but uh, a man who looked just like you saved my life in Belson. The man confirmed it was he who had thrown the bread. The bread. We embraced, we wept, and then walked arm in arm to the man's tiny little flat in Old Montague Mansions on the corner of Black Line Yard, amazingly just a few yards from my sister's flat. I was that child. The man carrying me was my father. I was eight months old when my older sister and my parents were taken to Bergen-Belsen concentration camp. And we were survived nearly two years late, we survived and were liberated nearly two years later, and not by the British Army, but that's another story I don't have time to tell you today. It's important to understand that for children in the Holocaust, liberation did not bring freedom. Children were the greatest victims of the Holocaust. And we have to remember that even the children of Nazis were victims of the Holocaust. 93% of the Jewish children of Europe were murdered. That is one and a half million children. I'll say it again, one and a half million innocent children. We found ourselves in London, penniless and alone, 
and someone recommended a charity. There my sister and me were examined by a white-coated doctor and we were suffering from malnutrition. We were half the expected weight and height that we should be. Now the doctor was clearly an important man and he was served tea and biscuits on Bone China in front of us, but they didn't think to offer us even a glass of water. He made his judgments in a tone that said his decisions were not to be questioned. My mother, who had just been granted British citizenship, was terrified of offending, offending the adults and fearing that we might be sent back to Poland. She hung on his every word and obeyed without question. What the children needed was fresh air and good food, and he was sending us to a children's home. He, his tone implied he was being generous and we should be grateful. And so we found ourselves in the children's home. I was three years old, spoke only Polish and Yiddish, and my sister was four years older than me but they separated the boys from the girls. So my protective older sister was taken away from me. The next thing they did was strip me naked and line me up with other boys in the shower room. And I knew what shower rooms might mean. I was terrified. Then I was put into a huge dormitory with metal beds. I was totally isolated. And like all children who are distressed and upset, I wet the bed. In the children's home, this was a serious offense. And the next morning, I was made to stand on a chair in front of all the children, and I was deprived of food, deprived of breakfast, and forced to watch the others while they ate. This increased my re regression, and that night, I soiled myself. My bed was then moved into an unheated corridor on the coldest winter we'd had for 50 years. So well as, as well as losing weight, my feet suffered frostbite. Our parents, in that time of civilized treatment of children, were allowed one visit per month. The matron threatened us with dire consequences if we complained to our parents. After nine months, I was in a miserable state. When my father saw that I was limping and he found frostbite on my feet, we then explained to him what had been happening. He immediately confronted the nurse, or the matron rather, and he took us home a few days later. I do not remember the journey. I believe I slept on my father's shoulder the whole time. I remember these events as if they were yesterday. I was three years and 10 months old. I find myself smiling when I think of our tiny home, which was a slum in the East End. When we, that is her children, were taken from my mother, she suffered a psychotic depression. She was admitted to psychiatric hospital and required electric convulsion therapy. I think it's important to remember that Holocaust survivors were ordinary human beings who were forced to endure extraordinary events and the psychological strengths were the same with which to cope with it were the same as for all human beings, that is, you and me. London in 1946 had just survived the, the Blitz. Every family had lost members during the war and during the Blitz. And everyone hated the Germans, the Nazis. When you live in a troubled world, it causes serious psychological difficulties. 
it affects your ability to, to manage life. Now, being a quiet and observant child, I noticed how my parents were consumed, understandably, uh, with hate for the Germans. But what I also noticed was that, and I, I have to say this was some, time, some years later, I noticed that what trauma does is it wounds you, it damages the brain in such a way that you have a constant wound and it scars over, but it's there always. And what I realized was happening is hate stops the wound healing and in fact it can enlarge it. And just like a wound that you might have uh, and like the patients I treated as a doctor, um, it can fester, become infected, and so the wound can infect you like, and cause the, the psychological effect that is similar to sepsis. It can make you ill and even kill you. If you look if, you, if any of you have seen the, the documentary made by the Russians who liberated Auschwitz, the, you will see a crowd of prisoners uh, wearing lots of layers of clothes and over them are pajamas, prison pajamas. And there's a little woman, little girl in the front. Her name was Eva Moses Kaur. And she and her sister were one of the two twins, one of the many twins, who were experimented on by uh, the beast of, uh, or, the, or the angel of death of Auschwitz, Dr. Mengele. She grew up to make a good life and she was asked to speak to a guard who had survived and uh, was living in Germany. She, she agreed to speak to this guard in Aus from Auschwitz and she noticed the man was consumed with guilt and was suffering terribly. And she decided that she would forgive him, that she could have gone on hating him and letting him continue his suffering, but she decided she was going to forgive him. And she forgave him and she saw how it helped him and she also saw how it helped herself. I struggled with some of these difficulties when I was at school. And I thought that I was not gonna spend my life hating Germans, like my parents and uh, the British people who had suffered terribly in the Blitz. I knew there wasn't a lot of difference between the Nazis hating all Jews and everyone hating all Nazis, or all Germans, rather, all Germans. And so I decided that I wanted to heal people, to become a healer that was a doctor. But in those days, in those days, getting into medical school was like getting through the eye of a needle. I spent 12 years studying and eventually ply, after 12 years I got into medical school. But towards the end of my medical degree, my wife showed the first signs of multiple sclerosis. We'd had two daughters, but her, in, her illness became a disastrous bur burden. When she died, the life that I had tried so hard to make to escape from my Holocaust past disintegrated. But I responded to try to be creative. I tried to face my childhood rather than run away from it. I formed a, an organization of other child survivors where we could talk to one another and be 
companions to each other. I co-founded the Holocaust Survivor Centre in North London. I began, I trained as a psychiatrist as well as a general practitioner and as a psychotherapist and I did tra trauma work for 30 years with Holocaust survivors. And this led me to understand so many gaps in the knowledge about trauma and to learn how to heal our wounds. This led me to become a, an international spe specialist in trauma and working particularly with survivors from the Middle East, um, trauma survivors, and to publish new theories and a book. So, despite living through severely troubled times, by choosing to become a healer, it has given me a wonderful, productive, and fulfilling life. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alfred. And thank you for your inspiration, your commitment, your determination to the cause of Holocaust Memorial Day. The following piece of music, There Is a Place for Us, is performed by the soloist Andrew McBride. Although many millions were murdered, their lives cruelly cut short, those who survived genocide are left to pick up the pieces and to rebuild shattered lives in circumstances where freedom is often fragile. This song speaks of rebuilding lives and building a better future something Holocaust Memorial Day encourages us all to help bring about. Someday a time for 
the 10 stages of genocide, as identified by Professor Gregory Stampton, demonstrate that genocide never just happens. There is always a set of circumstances which occur, or which are created, to build the climate in which genocide can take place, and in which perpetrator regimes can remove the freedoms of those they are targeting. It was during the build-up to genocide in Nazi Germany in the 1930s that Otto Goldberger took a risk that led him to freedom. We invited Melvin, Otto's son, to share the experiences of his father with students from the film and television school in Belfast Metropolitan College. They created a short film which we are showing in public for the first time this evening. Do you remember me? My name is Melvin Goldberger. I was born here in Belfast and I am the son of Otto Goldberger, uh, a Holocaust survivor who was born in Vienna in the Austro-Hungarian Empire. After returning from the Olympics, my uh, fa father and his brother decided that they would uh, set up a small business together and they opened up a small shirt factory in Vienna and employed a small number of staff and had quite a thriving business. Then came November 1938, the famous Kristallnacht, the night of the broken glass, when the Nazis went on the rampage across Austria and Germany. And on that night, my father was arrested. Although his local staff did their best to try to hide him in the cellar of the factory, the Nazis caught up with him. And one morning they were being lined up, counted and loaded onto the wagons and taken to an unknown fate. And so my father was standing there and just suddenly out of the corner of his eye, he recognised one of the SS guards as an old school friend that he had played with many years before. Franz, Franz, do you remember me? Under the cover of darkness, the SS man came back and said, Otto Goldberger, I remember you, you were the swimmer. And he camouflaged him and smuggled him out of the camp. While he was in London for this short period, Australia and New Zealand closed its doors to all Austrian German nationals uh, and they were, they were declared as enemy aliens, would not be allowed to enter the country. His visa for the United Kingdom expired, so basically he was an illegal immigrant. Now his famous story is that he went up to a woman in Trafalgar Square in London and asked what number bus to take to Londonderry. So he was, it was explained to him that you had to take a ferry. He had to go to Holyhead in Wales, take a ferry to Dunleary outside Dublin, to Belfast, and then on to Derry, Londonderry. So he boarded the train, and the train came to the border, and the British authorities came onto the train. He was, this was a shock to his system because he didn't know that he was trying to re-enter the United Kingdom and he didn't have a visa. So they came to him, what is your name? Otto Goldberger not a very Irish name. To cut a long story short, he was marched off the train and was taken as a guest of His Majesty at Crumlin Road Jail, where he was accused of being a German spy and spent three weeks in Crumlin Road Jail.
we would like to thank the students and staff for their creative work in producing the film, and Melvin for sharing his family's experiences and for joining us this evening. Holocaust Memorial Day 2024 marks the 30th anniversary of the genocide against the Tutsis in Rwanda, 49 years after the Holocaust ended. 19 years after the genocide in Cambodia, the world stood by as Hutu extremists murdered approximately one million Tutsis and moderate Hutus in just 100 days. It was a genocide carried out almost entirely by hand, usually using machetes and clubs, and followed decades of tension, violence, and erosion of Tutsi freedoms. On the radio, they were telling them, kill every Tutsi. We don't need any Tutsi being left. So take your machetes, take everything, everything you've got, go and kill every Tutsi. That's when we start seeing all the Hutus walking on the street with the machetes. Now to help us to remember those murdered during the Holocaust and other genocides, we will read the Statement of Commitment. The statement is read by individuals representing communities across Northern Ireland. And I'd now ask Melvin Goldberger, Nola Toman, Pelagy Buchanan, Cadet Sergeant William Patton, Owen McElveen, Adam Osborne, Alendra Chirpachi, Julian and Susan Warner to read the commitment. We recognize that the Holocaust shook the foundations of modern civilization. Its unprecedented character and horror will always hold universal meaning. We believe the Holocaust must have a permanent place in our nation's collective memory. We honor the survivors still with us and reaffirm our shared goals of mutual understanding and justice. We must make sure that future generations understand the causes of Holocaust and reflect upon its consequences. We vow to remember the victims of Nazis persecution and all genocide. We value the sacrifices of those who have risked their lives to protect or rescue victims as a touchstone of the human capacity for good in the face of evil. 
we recognise that humanity is still scarred by the belief that race, religion, disability or sexuality make some people's lives worth less than others. Genocide, anti-Semitism, racism, xenophobia and discrimination still continue. We have a shared responsibility to fight these evils. We pledge to strengthen our efforts to promote education and research about the Holocaust and other genocides. We will do our utmost to make sure that the lessons of such events are fully learned. Amen. Promise us to bear us a more effort to encourage us to search the history, to learn information, and our Holocaust to have ever crimi the genocide that is temporary and lume. Us to bear us a more possibility to be sure us that the lexi and the other events are not going to be repeated again. Amen. We will continue to encourage Holocaust remembrance by holding an annual Holocaust Memorial Day. We condemn the evils of prejudice, discrimination and racism. We value a free, respectful and democratic society. We come now to the act of commemoration for the six million Jews murdered in the Holocaust, for the millions of people murdered under Nazi persecution of other groups, and in more recent genocides in Cambodia, Rwanda, Bosnia, and Darfur. I'd now like to invite Dr. Alfred Garwood and Pelagi Buchanan to light the candle in memory of those who were murdered, murdered for who they were. Could I ask you please, ladies and gentlemen, to stand. Please be seated. I'm now going to invite Rabbi David Kale, MBE, who will sing a prayer for the repose of the souls of the departed in Hebrew. But before he does that, he will read that prayer in English. Rabbi. O oh God, full of mercy, 
who dwells on high, grant proper rest on the wings of the divine presence in the lofty levels of the holy and the pure ones who shine like the glow of the firmament for the souls of the holy and the pure ones who are killed, murdered, slaughtered, burned, drowned, and strangled in Auschwitz, Shumeno, Trebinka, Sorbibor, Maidunik, Bijets, and Mali Trotsonets for the sanctification of God's name through the hands of the German oppressors. We today are praying on their behalf in remembrance of their souls. May their resting place be in the Garden of Eden. May the Master of Mercy shelter them in the shelter of his wings for eternity. And may he bind their souls in the bond of life. The Lord is their heritage. And may they repose in peace on their resting places. And let us all say, Amen. El mole rakamim shokein bamaroimim hamsein man kan kaino takas kan feyhashtino malhoyz kadai shimuta hoyrim. Gazoa Horakio Mazahirim Es Nishmohoyz Achainu Yachyoseinu Ashe Nishpakto Mom Kamaim Shiavtu Borazos Takas Mim Sheles Germarno Ona Bal harachamim, hasti rein b'sei sekno fecho liya elamim. Usro hoir bisra chayim es nishmosom, adinoi hu nachlosom, yanuach v'shalom, hamishkavom v'noi mar, amen. Naved Siddiqui, trustee of the Holocaust Memorial Day Trust, will read We Remember Them by Sylvan Cummins and Rabbi Jack Reamer. In the rising of the sun and its going down, we remember them. In the blowing of the wind and in the chill of winter, we remember them. In the opening of buds and in the warmth of summer, we remember them. In the rustling of leaves and the beauty of autumn, we remember them. In the beginning of the year and when it ends, we remember them. When we are weary and in need of strength, we remember them. When we are lost and sick at heart, we remember them. When we have joys we yearn to share, we remember them. So long as we live, they too shall live. For they are now a part of us as we remember them.
we would like to include a moment of reflection for two people who died recently and were an important part of the Northern Ireland community in Holocaust remembrance, Ruthie Conner and Walter Seculis. And sadly, another member of the community passed away this morning, Mr. George Block. We would like to pause to remember them all. Rabbi David Kiel will blow the shofar to symbolise the end of our act of commemoration. Anne Frank's comment, quoted earlier, concludes, you couldn't do this and you couldn't do that, but life went on. But of course, for Anne and millions of others, life did not go on. They were deliberately murdered. Building upon the multiple restrictions to their freedoms, their final freedom, the freedom to life, was taken from them. On Holocaust Memorial Day 2024, we can all reflect on how freedom is fragile and vulnerable. As we come together in our community, let us pledge not to take our freedoms for granted and consider what we can do to strengthen freedoms around the world. This marks the end of our commemoration. And as we bring things to a close, we would like to say a special thank you to our speakers, to our distinguished guests, and to everyone here this evening for your participation. It will also help the organizers if you are able to fill in the feedback form which is on your seat. For now, let me welcome you to stay for a cup of coffee or tea which will be served in the banqueting hall and kosher biscuits are also on offer. To all of you I say, Shalom. <laughs>